And this lecture introduces a section of the course on social identity theory. We're going to introduce some of the basic concepts and ideas behind social identity theory and also work towards defining well, what is a social group. Groups are so important for us here in social psychology. How do we define a group? What is a group? And how do groups affect us as individuals? That's really what identity is about, social identification. How group membership becomes psychologically significant for us. And it's essentially what social psychology is all about. So the originator of the theory is Henri Tarshville. He um, grew up in Poland. I think he's originally from Poland. He's a Jew, lived in Europe throughout the, the Holocaust, the war. So you can imagine what, what that was like. He, he fled into France and eventually made his way over as a mature student now to England. He won a prize, actually. He wrote an essay on prejudice. He won a prize that enabled him entrance into university and became one of the most famous social psychologists of the of the 20th century. Uh, he has his, his legacy was a bit tarnished late in life. There's been some revelations about um, uh, sexual misconduct and uh, harassment of, of women students. <clears throat> but nonetheless, as a <clears throat> social psychologist, he's an important character. And we're going to look at uh, his work in some detail and some of the influences of his work on later generations of students. So to start an in, a broad introduction, we can consider the question, why do people commit suicide? And we think of suicide as a deeply personal phenomenon. Someone who must be immensely troubled, personally troubled, to, to bring themselves to commit suicide. He has a list of causes of suicide by the ex-professor of psychiatry at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, Lauren Schleerbosch. So why do people commit suicide? Well, the, the top ranking among them are interpersonal problems, marital problems, partner relations, family problems. There's a whole set of financial problems, stress, academic problems, failure at school, failure at university, psychological disorders, especially related to alcohol use and depression, um, incest. There's ever been, there's even been some evidence that it's related to, to weather. If you're long periods of overcast, and bad weather tends to, tends to precipitate suicidal behavior. So if you look at this list, it's all related to the individual, their situation in life, their psychological problems. So there's a, here we are, we've got individualistic approaches to um, the suicide behavior. But it's interesting that there's also sociological explanations. In addition to these psychological explanations that focus on mental illness and depression and, and stress, and take a look at a very old <clears throat> quote from Emil Durkheim. Man is more vulnerable to self-destruction the more he's detached from any collectivity. So suicide is thus about three times more frequent among bachelors than among married people. Wars in stimulating patriotism Silence, preoccupation with self and suicide decreases. There's hardly any suicide in time of war. So, as linking back to our previous lecture on realistic group conflict theory, in situations where the collective is engaged in um, um, war, for example, there's, there's a collective rationale to life, then suicide wanes. And so there's been thoughts in social psychology throughout the history, is there such a thing as a group mind, a collective psychology, a collective depression, or collective anxiety? You can think, for example, how the COVID-19 pandemic affected collectives. Yes, people felt isolated, depressed, anxious, but it wasn't just uh, individuals alone feeling that. The whole society, this, this mood, spread across the whole society. Everyone locked down in their own houses, but sharing a sense of anxiety, uncertainty, aloneness, etc. So is there such a thing as a group mind? Is there such a thing as group or collective causes or collective depression? And that's essentially what we want to work towards. You remember we discussed earlier on about levels of analysis. What is a good theory? Well, a good theory doesn't want to just reduce explanations down to an individual level. We want to 
understand how the individual, and certainly it is individuals that commit suicide and feel depressed, but how are these feelings at an individual level associated with what's happening at a group level in society? And how should we connect these? That's it, or the, to avoid reductionism, how do we connect the functioning of individuals to the functioning of society? Now, this is where social identity theory helps us because it provides us a theory of this connection, how we as individuals are connected into uh, societies that we, that we live in. <clears throat> and this over here is the point of connection, is categorization. Because as we discussed in our previous lecture on cognition, categorization is something that we all do all the time. It's a fundamental a cognitive mechanism. We classify objects into groups, and these are cultural categories. You remember we spoke about knives and forks and spoons, and uh, it's it's we, we this is simply how we've inherited these categories out of our culture, and we see the world in its terms. But there's a difference between categorizing knives, forks, and spoons, and categorizing people. And I don't know if you can see or guess what that difference is. Well, the difference is because we, as individuals, belong to one of those categories. And so it has a lot of personal significance for us, whether we are a spoon or a knife. And there's a lot of contestation around categories as which one is better. Knives, forks and spoons, there's no contestation on which one's better, each one's for, its, for the task that we need it. But when it comes to social categories, we self-categorize and then these categories become personally relevant and there's a whole lot of evaluative um, force on those categories and on our membership of them. And that's just, those are some of the themes that we're going to pick up in the next few lectures. So if you ask people to define themselves, who are you? <clears throat> they will say things like this, you know, I'm a student, I'm a dad, I'm a woman, I'm a man, I'm a Muslim, I'm a rebel, I'm a star. And you, you look at these terms of self-definition and you'll notice that they're all social categories of time of one kind or another. Some of them are more personal, like I'm a time waste, it's an, it's an individual uh, idiosyncrasy, I'm a star. But all the others are social categories, a girl, a rebel, a Muslim, a woman, a dad, a man, etc. These are social categories. So when we think of ourselves or when we define ourselves or we communicate, who are you? We often think in terms of these social categories. So this is Tajfel's contribution to our thinking, and it's, a, and it's a fantastic contribution, that identity ranges along a continuum from individual identity on the one hand to social identity on the other. And sometimes when we think about ourselves, we do think about ourselves in our individual terms. We compare ourselves with others. For example, I'm a time waster. My brother or sister is much more uh, diligent around time. Um, I procrastinate. Someone else doesn't procrastinate. I like uh, salty things. They like sweet things, etc., etc. These are comparisons that happen between individuals. And it occurs at the individual identification end of this continuum. Right at the other end, we've got social identity. This is where we view ourselves as members of a group. And often we view ourselves as interchangeable with other members of that group. And we compare our group with the other group. And the example that uh, Tajfal and Turner gave to illustrate this, you can imagine yourself on a date. And uh, you you are chatting to your partner across the table and you're talking about yourselves and discovering well, what kind of person is this like? Who, what am I like? And, you, and it, it's a, a, a classic or prototypical example of individual identity with inter-individual comparisons. Can I get on with this person? What's this person like compared to other individuals? On the other hand of this continuum, Tarshfeld used the example of two countries at war. Can you imagine being in an army and over there is the enemy and you, you're fighting with this enemy? You don't know who the individuals are. You're not even interested in who the individuals are. It's about us versus them. 
So in that situation, we've got social identity operating. In the other situation, we have individual identity operating. And, and Tartfield argues that we can move from social identity to individual identity. It's, it's mobile, us as individuals. And this is the, the key to this articulation between the individual and society. Because we as individuals can start acting and thinking as representatives of a group, as group members. So this theory that we're talking about here was developed by one of Tarshville students, John Turner. He developed into a theory called self-categorization theory, and it's, described, it's defined as, a, as a circumstances under which a person will perceive themselves as belonging to a collective, and when you start perceiving yourself belonging to a collective, what are the consequences of those, that, that categorization? I can give the example of uh, driving in a, in a taxi. You're going from Peter Maritzburg to Durban, and everyone in the taxi is thinking about their own thoughts, you know, what they're going to do over there, you know, what it was like at home. They, they, they're wrapped up in their own world, individual identity. You know, what's the purpose of my journey to Durban? But if the taxi driver starts speeding, goes faster and faster and faster, and it's 120, 130, eventually everyone in the taxi starts thinking, we're going to die here. And now we start thinking, not as an individual, you're no longer thinking about what you're going to do in Durban when you arrive there, but you're thinking about us. What are we going to do? We suffering. So there's been the switch in identification from individual identification to collective identification, a switch from an I to a we. And um, this is essentially what self-categorization theory is about. Under what circumstances does that switch happen? And then when it happens, what are the consequences? Well, these are the consequences of self-categorization. When we categorize ourselves as group members, when we move from the individual to the social identity side of this uh, continuum, the first thing that happens is the, the kinds of social comparisons that we make change. At the individual level of identity, we focus on inter- individual or interpersonal comparisons. We compare ourselves. What am I like compared to my brother or sister? Well, how, am, how am I compared to my friends? On the group side, we consider how is my group doing compared to that group? And so the, the, the comparisons here are comparisons between groups. We've spoken early, early in an early lecture about the accentuation effect. As soon as we start thinking about ourselves in group terms, we accentuate the differences between groups and we accentuate the, the similarities between individuals within a group. So we spoke then about that almost this, this perceptual distortion that is associated with group thinking. Our self-perceptions change. We start viewing ourselves as interchangeable with other members of that group and we view others, other, our group members, as, as interchangeable. When we view ourselves as a man as opposed to a person, we start stereotyping ourselves in masculine ways or feminine ways or racial ways. So we, stereotyping is not only something that other people do to us, we can self-stereotype. So when we view ourselves as a group member, we start changing our perception of who we are. Importantly, our self-esteem, our sense of self-worth becomes bound up with the status of our group. So if our group is doing well, we're on the top, we're the best group, we are in the, 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 the soccer team we support is the top of the league, we feel fantastic. But if every week our soccer team gets beaten over and over, we start feeling negative, we might change teams or, or give up watching uh, soccer, it's just too, uh, too negative. So our self-esteem gets wrapped up in the fate of our group. And of course, then finally, our behavior changes. We take on group forms of behavior. You can see this in crowd behavior. When people start viewing themselves and defining themselves as members of the crowd, they behave in ways that they don't, wouldn't behave just as individuals walking down the street. And so there's a whole series, and we're going to unpack these in the, in the lectures that follow, a whole series of social psychological effects of categorizing ourselves as group members. So what now determines whether we're going to be at the individual side of this continuum or at the group side? What determines 
whether we view ourselves in terms of our individual identity, making inter-individual comparisons, or in terms of our group identity, making intergroup comparisons. Well, what Turner argues, a, a salient social category determines categorization. So if social categories are salient, then we will view ourselves in terms of those categories. So salient basically means, is it present in our cognitions? Is it relevant to the situation? Think of the taxi example. The group identity wasn't salient. We were just all going to Durban. But as soon as the driver was speeding and putting our lives at risk, then all of a sudden being a member of this group became salient. So salience is something that is immensely fluid and changes with situations. So you have three, three uh, factors that affect category salience. The first is um, that they, they talk about perceiver readiness. Some people are, and all of us to a certain degree in our societies, are primed to think of the world in terms of certain categories. For example, racists always see the, the, the social world in terms of black or white. They see people in racial terms. Sort of devout Christians might, uh, fundamentalists might see people as, as saved versus sinners. And, and they, they, they look at the whole world in, in, in terms of that, that perceiver readiness for a certain kind of categorization. But most generally, and this is true for all humans really, is that the, the kinds of categories that we use in any time, how we see ourselves and others, depends on the situation. And you'll see the two forms of fit. The first is comparative fit. We look around the situation and we see, well, who's here? And then we compare the categories that are there and we locate ourselves within a category. So that they really, uh, comparative fit depends on observation. We look and we see who's in the world and then we categorize ourselves in a relevant category. And normative fit, well, what kind of categories suit this situation? So in a lecture theater, for example, in a classroom situation, we classify ourselves as students and as lecturers. That's how we, we walk in there and the categories that apply to us by comparative fit and by normative fit are lecture student categories. And we think of ourselves and we behave in those terms. So the, the classroom situation is a very good example of social behavior where we, we act out the roles that we have as students and lecturers. So what are the determinants of categorization of? Yeah, how do you think the people in this crowd are viewing themselves? So this is the 20, uh, 2010 World Cup. This was the match in Mozambique Stadium going into the match between South Africa and Nigeria. How are those people categorizing themselves? Well, you can see with the flags, etc., that national categories are salient. People are viewing themselves as South Africans there. There's this joyous carnival of being South African going to the game. You can imagine race or gender at that stage might not be salient, but if someone in the crowd started behaving in a sexist or racist manner, then all of a sudden this new form of categorization would become salient. How do the people in this situation view themselves? There's um, the landless people's movement marching towards Pretoria. The categorization there is between us, the dispossessed, and you, the police. The, you can see how situations create or give us the, the salient categories with which to view ourselves and which to, to act on how to behave. Not only to view ourselves, but action, feelings, our emotions are all involved in the form of categorization that we are participating in. And how about this situation over here? Yeah, we've got EFF members and the police outside the South African Parliament. What are the salient categorizations there? Well, it's the people in the crowd, they, they you can see the uniforms, they, they, they displaying their identity, aren't they? They're viewing themselves as EFF members. What happens if one of those EFF members uh, starts behaving in a way that's unacceptable, for example, with violence, then all of a sudden the other crowd might say, hey, we, that's not, this is not who we are. We are not behaving with violence. But if the police behave with violence, then all of a sudden the, 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 the view that the, 
the EFF members have of themselves is not only of EFF members, but now victims of police aggression, then they will act in a similar way. So the categorizations in how we view ourselves and how we act are very fluid, linked into the situations that we're in. We look at the situation and we see who the categories are, but norms change, the behavioral norms change as the situation unfolds. So that there's been an introduction to categorization and self-categorization, we're going to use this to briefly define well, what is a social group. Historically, social psychologists define groups in quite formal terms. Uh, you're, you're, you're a group of, of, of people that are, are together. A soccer team, for example, is, is viewed as a group. So they're the kinds of criteria for group membership. Contact, co-presence, we're a crowd together, common interests, the group of stamp collectors, and you focus on a, on a whole lot of individuals that are members of a group. What social identity theory helps us do with this idea of self-categorization says, no, no, group membership is an idea in people's heads. When people view themselves, when they move from that individual level of the continuum to the social side of the continuum, it's in that movement that group membership becomes salient and that we should understand what a, what a group is. So there's a definition from Hogg and Abrams. Belonging to a group is a psychological state, which is quite distinct from being a unique and separate individual, and it confers social identity, a shared collective representation of who we are, how we should behave. And so we, we're shifting our focus over here from a whole lot of individuals by some criterion that belong to a group, whether they you know, all members of the soccer team or all together in the crowd, to, the, to a psychological definition of a group as an idea that is a link to social identification and it's linked to that continuum of identification. So for example, this over here is a, a group of, they're called Trekkies. There's a, um, a film and TV series called Star Trek, a long time ago. And people identified in the different lounges, in the different houses, in suburbs, especially in the United States, but actually all over the world. And people identified uh, with being becoming a Trekkie. And they, as you can see, this is a convention of all the Trekkies. There's a sense of we. There's a sense of we, us, we identify. You see someone else that likes Star Trek or you see someone else that likes this football team or you see someone else that is in, a, in some other way affiliated to the same group as you and you have a sense that we belong to the same group. And there's no end. The second, third bullet point there, the, so, the social imagination allows for diverse identification. There's no end to the kinds of groups that we can belong to. And of course, opinions are very important in defining uh, group membership. For example, today you find people part of an anti-vax group. They uh, resist vaccination. There's this conspiracy theory, QAnon. These all work through sense of identification. There's a sense of who we are. If you look at groups on Facebook and other social media, we find collective identification from people living in diverse areas around ideas, practices, views of, of group membership. And of course, these uh, memberships change our experiences. As soon as we identify ourselves with a group, our experience of reality changes. If you're an anti-vaxxer, you might feel quite persecuted by the mainstream, by um, uh, medical science. And of course, this group membership also has enormous consequences that we'll consider in the, in the lectures that follow. So here's a definition of a social group to take away. The identity approach posits the necessary and sufficient conditions for the formation of a group. And what is that? It's awareness of a common group membership. That you self-categorize as a member of this group. And so we can define a group as a whole lot of individuals that have identified with the same group. Some uh, definitional terms. We often talk about an in-group in social psychology and an out-group. An in-group is a group that you belong to. This is over here as a, a cricket team. It, ne it might not necessarily be a physical team that you belong to. It could be an abstract group with people that share the same kind of opinions as you. You can think of uh, the friends that you've got in your social media, those that you identify with and the ideas that you identify around, and those that you sort of reject. They're an, an out-group. 
of course that is our next uh, definition our group it's a group that you don't belong to a group of thems over there they've got different opinions different beliefs than than you have you're not part of of them the implications of, of uh, self-categorization we're going to unpack in the next couple lectures. Well, it, it has a sense for our own personal well-being. If our group is on the top of the log pile, on the top of the log, we feel great. If our group is fragmented, oppressed, we feel bad. Group identification is closely linked with prejudice, with social influence. We influence and are influenced by those in our group. And we become part, a group membership has a very powerful effect on who we will invite to our homes, who we will have in our peer networks, etc. So our social networks that we belong to are very much shaped by the kinds of groups, these identifications that we have. And there's a final slide just to sum up self-categorization theory, social identity theory. You have personal identity on the one hand, group identity on the other. On the one hand, you've got individualization. On the group side, we start thinking in group membership terms, self-stereotyping, we categorize ourselves, we interchangeable, depersonalize, interchangeable with other group members. These other group members can influence our behavior much more readily than, than our groups. And of course, as we discussed, this affects our motivations, our opinions, our actions, and our self-esteem. We'll be unpacking these concepts in much more detail in the lectures that follow.